Thomas Gray was an English poet and letter writer, most famous for his elegy written in a country churchyard, which was published in 1751, and I'm going to read the first five stanzas. It is thought that he began writing this poem in the graveyard of St Giles's Parish Church, Stoke Poges, where his aunt Mary Antrobus was buried. He was a classical scholar and professor at Pembroke College, Cambridge, and he preceded the Romantic poets. Elegy written in a country churchyard. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds save that from yonder ivy-mantled tower the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign beneath those rugged elms that yew trees shade where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap each in his narrow cell forever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. The breezy call of incense breathing morn, the swallow twittering from the straw-built shed, the cock's shrill clarion or the echoing horn, no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed. And now I'm going to read a poem on a lighter note. Horace Walpole, the son of the Prime Minister Robert Walpole, was a close friend of Thomas Gray's from his school days. And he wrote, Ode on the death of a favourite cat drowned in a tub of goldfishes in 1747. This is a mock elegy. The cat in question belonged to Horace Walpole and he later displayed the broken china vase on a pedestal at his Gothic revival villa, Strawberry Hill in Twickenham. Ode on the death of a favorite cat drowned in a tub of goldfishes. Twas on a lofty vase's side where China's gayest art had dyed the azure flowers that blow. Demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive Salima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tail her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws, her coat that with the tortoise vies her ears of jet and emerald eyes. She saw and purred applause. Still had she gazed, but midst the tide two angel forms were seen to glide, the genie of the stream. Their scaly armour's Tyrian hue through richest purple to the view betrayed a golden gleam. The hapless nymph with wonder saw a whisker first and then a claw. With many an ardent wish, she stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? What cats averse to fish? Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, again she stretched. Again she bent, nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled. 
the slippery verge, her feet beguiled, she tumbled headlong in. Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no Nereid stirred, no cruel Tom nor Susan heard. A favourite has no friend. From hence, ye beauties undeceived, no, one full step is ne'er retrieved, and be with caution bold. Not all that tempts your wandering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that glisters gold. A Dead Rose by Elizabeth Barrett Browning O oh Rose, who dares to name thee? No longer roseate now, nor soft nor sweet, but pale and hard and dry as stubble wheat. Kept seven years in a drawer, thy titles shame thee. The breeze that used to blow thee between the hedgerow thorns and take away an odour up the lane to last all day, if breathing now, unsweetened, would forego thee. The sun that used to smite thee and mix his glory in thy gorgeous urn till beam appeared to bloom and flower to burn, if shining now, with not a hue would light thee. The dew that used to wet thee, and white first grow incarnadined, because it lay upon thee where the crimson was, if dropping now, would darken where it met thee. The fly that lit upon thee to stretch the tendrils of its tiny feet along thy leaf's pure edges after heat, if lighting now, would coldly overrun thee. The bee that once did suck thee, and build thy perfumed ambers up his hive, and swoon in thee for joy, till scarce alive, if passing now, would blindly overlook thee. The heart doth recognise thee, alone, alone, the heart doth smell thee sweet, doth view thee fair, doth judge thee most complete, though seeing now those changes that disguise thee. Yes, and the heart doth owe thee more love, dead rose, than to such roses bold as Julia wears at dances, smiling cold. Lie still upon this heart which breaks below thee. Swinburne was an English poet and also a playwright, novelist and critic, as well as contributing to the 11th edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. His father was an admiral and he grew up on the Isle of Wight, but he came from a Northumbrian family and from 1857 to 1860 was a member of Lady Trevilian's intellectual circle at Wallington Hall. A Match by Algernon Charles Swinburne If love were what the rose is, and I were like the leaf, our lives would grow together in sad or singing weather, blown fields or flowerful closes, green pleasure or grey grief. If love were what the rose is, and I were like the leaf, if I were what the words are, and love were like the tune, With double sound and single delight our lips would mingle, With kisses glad as birds are that get sweet rain at noon. If I were what the words are, and love were like the tune. 
If you were life, my darling, and I your love were death, we'd shine and snow together, ere March made sweet the weather with daffodil and starling and hours of fruitful breath. If you were life, my darling, and I your love were death. If you were thrall to sorrow, and I were page to joy, we'd play for lives and seasons with loving looks and treasons and tears of night and morrow and laughs of maid and boy if you were thrall to sorrow and I were page to joy. If you were April's lady and I were lord in May, we'd throw with leaves for hours and draw for days with flowers till day like night were shady and night were bright like day if you were april's lady and i were lord in may if you were queen of pleasure and i were king of pain we'd hunt down love together pluck out his flying feather and teach his feet a measure and find his mouth a rein if you were queen of pleasure and i were king of pain and now i'm going to read a poem about the cuckoo by william wordsworth some of us may remember when cuckoos were a feature of every spring they were always heard, even if not seen. It seems that in Wordsworth's time, they were also seldom seen. To the Cuckoo by William Wordsworth O oh, blithe newcomer, I have heard, I hear thee and rejoice. O oh, Cuckoo, shall I call thee bird, or but a wandering voice? While I am lying on the grass, thy twofold shout I hear. From hill to hill it seems to pass, at once far off and near. Though babbling only to the vale of sunshine and of flowers, thou bringest unto me a tale of visionary hours. Thrice welcome, darling of the spring. Even yet thou art to me no bird, but an invisible thing, a voice, a mystery. The same whom in my schoolboy days I listened to, that cry which made me look a thousand ways in bush and tree and sky. To seek thee did I often rove through woods and on the green, and thou wert still a hope, a love, still longed for, never seen. And I can listen to thee yet, can lie upon the plain and listen, till I do beget that golden time again. O oh, blessed bird, the earth we pace again appears to be an unsubstantial fairy place that is fit home for thee. We do hope you enjoyed listening today. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and share with friends and family. Thank you. Goodbye.